Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'll just introduce myself and, and then uh, hand you over to David. So my name's Naomi and I work in the Outreach Service at the Par Houses of Parliament. Uh, this event is part of a series of events called Open Lectures, which we do for uh, university students and academics. Um, a lot of them take place in Westminster, but we are trying out taking them on the road because we realise a lot of people can't get to Westminster. So very grateful to uh, the University of Hull for hosting this for us. And also very grateful to David Natzler for coming up to Hull um, to talk to you about legislation. Um, David, as I'm sure you all know, is uh, Director General of the Chamber and Committee Services in the House of Commons. So he's got a really uh, unique perspective of legislation going through uh, Parliament, which he will talk to you about. Uh, I will be in touch after today to send you a little link where you can give us some feedback, but also a link to where this, uh, the film of this lecture is going to be on the website. We put films of all the open lectures on the website so that people can watch them afterwards or those who can't get to the lectures can watch them. And there's already a really good bank of lectures on there, so if you're interested, do go and have a look on the website. Uh, we've got Robert Rogers, who's Chief Executive of the House of Commons, um, giving an insider's guide to what goes on behind the scenes at the Commons. Uh, we've got uh, the Lord Speaker, Baroness de Souza, talking about her role in international relations. Uh, we have Andrew Kennan, who's the Clerk of Committees, talking about the role and reform of select committees, and that's just a few. Um, next month, we have got one of the archivists in the Parliamentary Archives talking about Parliament and suffragettes. Uh, which will be on the anniversary of the death of Emily Wilden Davison. So do check that out online, or if you're in London, come along um, on the 5th of June. So that's a, that's a little plug from me. Um, without further ado, then, um, I'd like to hand you over to David, who's going to give a lecture, and then we're going to turn the camera off, and you can ask him lots of questions, and he doesn't have to be bound by the fact he's being recorded. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Naomi. Well, can I start by also thanking the, the University of Hull for inviting me to give the latest in this open lecture series uh, under the auspices of parliamentary outreach. Uh, it is a particular pleasure for me to be in Hull for the first time since I, I bicycled here from London 25 years ago to raise funds for Anti-Slavery International. Uh, and it is a special privilege for me, as I'm a great, great, great grandson of William Wilberforce, to be in the Wilberforce building. So I am genuinely thrilled. Um, about 700 years ago, if I can take you back, in the 1320s, one of my distant predecessors wrote a little manual in Latin on how to hold a parliament called Modus Tenendi Parliamentum, or the way of holding a, or possibly the, parliament. Most of it is about who is to attend, how they get paid, where they sit, and so on. Only one of its 36 paragraphs deals with what a parliament is actually supposed to do. After discussion of affairs of state comes, and I quote in English, matters of common concern to the kingdom so that laws shall be enacted against the defects of customary law. So already that far away, Parliament was there for political discussion of the great matters of state, for the assent or withholding of taxes, for discussion and settling of grievances, but also increasingly from the 14th century to legislate. Now, its non-legislative functions are still crucial to Parliament's daily life in holding the executive to account, uh, fulfilled through debate uh, and scrutiny and question. Uh, in recent years, these have taken centre stage, and understandably so. They're relatively accessible and highly visible. Select committees, particularly in the last 30 years, the departmental select committees, are, are the jewel in our crown. Question time plays, Prime Minister's question time plays, to an audience of millions. The regular urgent questions that the current speaker has introduced keep the Commons abreast of breaking news. And debates, as a, as a form of political discourse, debates on issues are a well-understood form of political dialogue. By contrast, Parliament's legislative function is, is complex, it's sometimes inaccessible, it's based on texts, and to some eyes, infuriatingly slow. A bill can take all of 12 months or more to progress from introduction to royal assent, going through all its stages in both houses, and it gathers round it a panoply of papers and documentation, all beautifully set out, and this is a plug, uh, on the bill's pages of the Parliament website if you want to follow them. But it does show just how much paper there is, how much information there is gathering around a bill. The procedures we use to debate and decide on legislation are widely seen by academic and political observers as needing reform and refreshment. Uh, 
So in a limited time, what I'm going to try to do is convey some of the fascination and of the significance of Parliament's legislative role. Now, I'm conscious it's a political subject. Uh, bills are basically politics in action. Same-sex marriage, welfare reform, the European Union, banking, enough said. But it sure does make them interesting. I'm going to limit myself just to the commons. And in order to be topical just to the session that just ended, that session 2012-13, the second session of this coalition parliament, and I'm going to limit myself to primary legislation, that is to say, bills that become acts of parliament that have the force of law, rather than secondary legislation, which are statutory instruments made under powers granted under an act, but powers granted to ministers. Uh, I may drop in a few modest suggestions for reform. So firstly, what is legislation about? And quite interestingly, what is it not about? Well, for example, it doesn't really cover public expenditure except for form's sake. Spending plans are not subjected to the discipline of legislative procedure, nor are government borrowing or money supply. Foreign affairs and defence remain relatively unconstrained by legislation. There are now one or two EU bills each session. We had three in the last session, including the accession of Croatia to the EU, and there will be at least one in the forthcoming session. That every five years, there is an armed forces bill uh, which sets out the legal basis under which the forces operate. But by and large, those subjects are not the subject of legislation. But in general terms, just about everything else can be. In a sovereign parliament, almost anything can be legislated for except the weather, and, of course, the Climate Change Act uh, even uh, tried to do that. Uh, and we are now legislating or discussing legislating on subjects that the first Queen Elizabeth, those of you who have done this, the first Queen Elizabeth would have been appalled by, uh, interfering with succession uh, and even criticising the Episcopate of the Church of England. For whom do we legislate? The answer is for the United Kingdom or for its constituent parts. Virtually all bills cover England, most of them cover Wales, and some still cover Scotland and Northern Ireland, in whole or in part. That is why, on and off, for the last 30 years, people have been asking what's known as the West Lothian question, named for the then constituency of Tam Diel. Is it right that Westminster MPs from Scottish, or indeed Northern Ireland constituencies, can vote on legislation which has no effect on their constituents, and if not, is it possible to devise arrangements for English members to have some sort of special voting rights on England bills without undermining the validity of a government of the United Kingdom that relies on a majority in order to have its validity? Put crudely, why should Scottish MPs be able to vote on your university fees? Well, England and Wales, or England bills, are in fact the exception and rather not the rule. Only two of the 15 major government bills last session, defamation uh, and marriage same-sex couples, were England and Wales. And that can change in their passage through Parliament. In fact, the defamation bill, there was a clause that protected peer-reviewed statements in academic journals from action for defamation. That was extended to Scotland during its passage through the Commons. So something that started as an England bill became an England and Scotland bill. There has been a commission that recently reported on this, chaired by a former distinguished clerk of the House, uh, but I, I think it's fair to say that immediate results are, are not expected. This session, there was a Scottish bill, uh, which I will mention because it has uh, some unusual characteristic. It was called the Partnerships Prosecution Scotland Bill Lords, which originated in a report from the Scottish Law Commission. It's Tragic but interesting origins lie in a fire in January 24, 2004 at the Rosebank Care Home in Uddingston in South Lanarkshire in Scotland in which 14 residents died and where the owners were found to have infringed health and safety rules. They were in a partnership which they soon after dissolved and in 2008 the High Court of Justiciary in Scotland decided the dissolved partnership could not effectively be prosecuted and fined because, and you can read the judgment if you're an enthusiast, it didn't exist anymore, and therefore nor could the individual partners be fined. As you can imagine, for the relatives of the 14 who died at the Rosebank fire, this was intolerable. So the bill makes it now possible, basically, to fine a partnership, even if it doesn't exist, although not, of course, retrospectively. I don't suppose most members, even enthusiastic uh, observers of legislation, will have noticed uh, the passage of this particular bill. But it does meet in a small way that 1320s definition of some bills are there to improve the law, 
A lot of them, of course, are not. Where do bills come from? Well, a number of the larger government bills come down the traditional route of policy formation, debate and development, party manifesto, uh, sometimes media excitement, white hall digestion, green paper, consultation, white paper, possibly pre-legislative scrutiny, then through the sieve of the Parliamentary Business and Legislation Committee of the Cabinet to arrive on the floor of the House. Some have been years in preparation. Last session's defamation bill began in 2010 with Lord Lester of Hernhill's private member's bill on the subject. Others have their origins because of events. Events, dear boy, events, as the man said. Things that happen. Uh, the partnerships bill I've just mentioned. Uh, another one, we had the police complaints and conduct bill arose out of the Hillsborough independent panel report into the 1989 Hillsborough disaster so that the Independent Police Complaints Commission could reopen that case um, and also oblige serving police officers to be interviewed as witnesses. So those were cases where stuff happens, um, not always connected with tragedies, but sometimes. Now, if I can move to a slightly less somber example. Are, are there any, I don't know if there are any checks here. No, fine. The European Union Approvals Bill covered three separate, quite small issues which required primary legislation. And one was to establish that the electronic version of the European Union's official journal could be taken as the authoritative one. It arose out of a case brought by the Czech Customs Authorities. This is scarcely credible. The Czech Customs Authorities against a wine importer in Olomouc, who in 2004 had wrongly categorized as a fortified dessert wine an imported alcoholic drink he brought in called Kagor. Kagor, interestingly enough, is the Russian term for Kahor. Those of you who know the black wine of Kahor from southwestern France. Peter the Great brought it into Russia because he had a stomach disorder. And from then on, ever since, for 300 years, the Russians have been drinking something called Kagor, uh, which is a fortified sweet wine. And it's used as communion wine in the Russian Orthodox Church. I digress a bit. Uh, in Prague, analysis found that, in fact, it was, uh, as well as some grape juice, there was a lot of sugar beet alcohol and corn spirit. The importer got off prosecution for wrongly labelling it because he said that the new EU customs regulations were only electronically available in Czech, and therefore he couldn't be <coughs> expected to have read them. Uh, as a result of which, this, years later, this strange piece of legislation arrives in the House of Commons and we have to spend some time on it. So we are special thanks to, they're called Skoma Lux of Olomuts, if you want to buy it, used to be known as Olmuts, where a number of my Slovak ancestors used to do business selling the wines of Western Slovakia, which I assure you are not, have no corn spirit in them. Right, let's get back to bills. What are the main characteristics of bills? Well, the first thing you see is they're written in a language which is not simple which has to stand up in court under hostile scrutiny, and it has to have precise meaning. That means legal language, however, un however unuser-friendly that may be. Sometimes it means real intellectual complexity. Sometimes it means length. Few bills are complete unto themselves. Few of them are an island of, of statute unrelated to other statute. So they have to refer back to and often amend existing masses of statute law, which has itself been amended. I learned last week that every year, and this is a good fact for an essay, every year around 10 to 15,000 changes to existing statute law are made by the new statutes. I'd imagined about 100 to 150. There are thousands, thousands of little changes going through all the time. That makes it challenging to keep up with what the current law actually is, never mind how it's being changed. And it does suggest that the bills changing existing law should, as a matter of routine, be accompanied one way or another, i.e. hard copy or electronically, with a text showing how the relevant bit of the existing law would look if it were amended as is being proposed. The main characteristics of legislative procedure. Well, I'm sure there are those uh, here who could give you a better and, and a more precise definition than I can, but I'll give you a few characteristics. First, it is gradual and staged. It's not sudden. It's not a resolution. It takes time. A single bite is not enough. The material in bills is chewed over, and it's very time-consuming. Secondly, at Westminster, although obviously not in some other parliaments, it's bicameral, which sometimes means that the same meal is made of it in both houses. So it goes through two very similar processes. And it's a nuisance to change law once you've passed it, for those reasons. It takes as much 
time and trouble to change it as it did to agree it in the first place. And I think most importantly, it is textual and substantive. It's not intended to be contextual or symbolic or illustrative. It's not a work of literature, which is where I got those words from. Uh, and it can't be criticized as a work of literature. Uh, it, is, it is not for the faint-hearted. It is sometimes said on the basis of no evidence that Bismarck, who can't have known very much about the legislative process, I always think, and who once said that a Bavarian was halfway between an Austrian and a human being. But, but, but that Bismarck said, and forgive my German, je weniger die Leute darüber wissen, wie Würste und Gesetze gemarkt werden, desto besser schleffen sie nachts, which basically means the less that people know how sausages and laws are made, the better they'll sleep at night. So I hope you'll still be sleeping at night at the end of this lecture, but not before. So let's go to the Queen's speech a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, which gave notice of 15 main government bills. All but one, and that's House of Lords reform, have now become acts or are likely to do so fairly soon. The Queen's speech gives a list, but it's not an exclusive list. She says, memorably, other measures will be laid before you, and they are. Some are too minor to be worth mentioning, Some may still have not got the agreement of others, noticeably last session, the succession to the Crown Bill, which awaited the agreement of all the Commonwealth realms to the end of mild male primogeniture in succession to the Crown. Others were, in effect, emergency legislation, a different sort of events that then produces the need for law. The Police Pl Complaints and Conduct Bill, which I mentioned, We had a mental health approval functions bill, which went through in a day when it was discovered that in some regions, the power to approve specified doctors to detain patients under the mental health acts had been improperly delegated. And perhaps of more political interest, the job seekers back to work schemes bill in March, which dealt with the consequences of the so-called Poundland case. If you remember the young woman who was sent off for two weeks to work at Poundland. Others reflect ongoing policy development within government. Government policies don't have to be set in stone each year in May, put into the Queen's speech, and then they sit back and do nothing. They, politicians have ideas throughout the year. The Infrastructure Financial Assistance Bill and the Growth and Infrastructure Bill introduced in the autumn gave effect to ministerial proposals which had only crystallized best way to put it, in the autumn of 2012, as did the Welfare Benefits Uprating Bill. And the Marriage Same-Sex Couples Bill, which was introduced in January of this year, did indeed represent the outcome of a consultation that had begun in March 2012, but whose outcome was by no means certain at the time of the Queen's speech in May 2012. Now, who can bring in legislation? The answer is any member, and that includes, although I'm not talking about the Lords, any peer, whether or not supported by another member. You don't need a seconder, and you certainly don't need six people or ten people. A single member can simply present a bill, and once it's presented, it gets an automatic first reading, even if there is no text. All you need is a long title and a short title, and a day is then named for second reading. So presentation is a mere formality. There are some survivals of earlier procedures, and I'll mention one which is of political significance, which is called a 10-minute rule bill, which is a motion you seek the agreement of the House for leave to bring in a bill. Now, that is, in fact, the skeleton of a procedure which covered all bills until relatively recently, like 200 years ago, because these are old. <laughs> this is an old parliament. So twice a week on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, after oral questions and statements, a member has the chance to make a little speech seeking the leave of the House to bring in a bill. Convention since the Speaker's ruling of 1931 is that the, quote, brief explanatory statement permitted is to last for no more than 10 minutes, which to some people may seem quite a long explanatory statement. Uh, and therefore, it's known as a 10-minute rule bill. And then another member can make a similarly long speech in opposition, and then there can be a vote. There aren't many. There are about 45 bills a year. We had three votes in the last year. So it's a chance for a speech, but it is a remainder of some old tradition that the House didn't just let people present bills. They wanted to see if they would have leave, first of all. And indeed, on a side note, the uh, abolition of the slave trade bill, the first time in the first great debate, was on a motion from Wilberforce for leave to bring in the bill, as you will remember. Getting a bill presented is one thing which anyone can do. For a backbencher, getting it debated, let alone decided or passed into law, is very different. For backbenchers, there's a ballot. Uh, you draw, well, actually, I draw 20 numbers out of a hat uh, at the start of each session. So next Thursday morning, I'll be drawing the numbers, and the deputy speaker will be reading out the names. 
for the first time, and this is breaking news, for the first time we'll be doing it in reverse order. Because it used to be we picked out number one, and by the end of the ballot, people didn't mind who came 18th or 19th. So this time, the first name out is number 20, and the excitement will grow unbearably to see who is then number one. So these members then get priority on the 13 Fridays set aside for private members' bills each session. Now, the overall system is that only really non-controversial bills enjoying preferably active government support, absence of opposition opposition, and sometimes drafted by government lawyers, are likely to reach the statute book. Uh, and of the 10 that reached the statute book last year, nine were exactly that, what some people call handouts, meaning bills from government departments for which there was no time in the government's legislative program, usually short uh, and usually relatively non-controversial. The Procedure Committee is about to produce a great report on this, not in time for your exams, is about to produce a great report on this, which will no doubt suggest quite radical changes in procedure. Uh, in parenthesis, there's a quite separate category of bill called a private bill, which in very simple terms is a piece of local legislation. And as I'm here, I must mention the Humborough Bridge Bill, which was introduced in January and which has almost completed its common stages. Among many other amending provisions about the Humber Bridge, it sets the new statutory maxima, in effect, for tolls. I was glad to see that pedal cycles will continue to be free as they were 25 years ago. Uh, it'll also deal with speeding on the bridge. Just mention that in case any of you drive. From now on, I'll just be dealing, though, with the most, in a sense, important category, which is government bills, bills presented by ministers. The principles of bills are discussed on a debate on the question we read a second time. Now, that debate is usually scheduled to last for a day, meaning about six hours. And the question is a simple one, yes or no. And it's many years since a government bill, many, many years, was defeated on second reading. So you may say, why bother to debate it? What's the debate for if you know that the bill is going to get a second reading anyway? Well, there are three groups of people who may benefit. One is ministers. It gives them a chance to set out in public, televised, what the bill is for uh, and in some detail what its provisions will do and to put it in a political context. Secondly, the opposition have a chance to explain their view on the bill, which may well be uh, a little complicated. They may well welcome some bits of it and dislike other bits of it, particularly bills about crime, because no opposition wants to be seen to be against measures that are there to put down crime. And backbenchers have an opportunity to make speeches setting out their own views, but perhaps most crucially to intervene on a minister speaking and put a question to him or her and get an answer on one specific issue in the bill that maybe causes them concern. Uh, and in a large legislature, in the House of Commons with 650 members with a constrained timetable, individual backbench members are otherwise largely divorced from any detailed engagement with the process of legislation. And it's not strictly true to say it's a yes-no question, because in the Commons you can table what's called a second reading amendment, which has to be framed so that if it were passed it would be fatal to the bill, where you can express in no more than 250 words why you dislike the bill. If it's selected by the Speaker, it's put to the House for decision, and if passed, it's fatal. And of course the government will win if it's a straightforward opposition reasoned amendment, but it gives the opposition a chance to explain why they maybe dislike one bit of the bill but not another bit, and they don't want to be on the record as having voted against second reading and be told, oh, but you voted against this wonderful provision. Uh, an example, in December, there was a reasoned amendment on the energy bill from the opposition, which affirmed support for what they're doing on the electricity market, but objected to the absence of a decarbonisation target. So they voted on their amendment, but they then didn't vote against second reading of the bill. Once a government bill has been given a second reading, it's the subject of a programme order. The system of programming, which means timetabling legislation, as opposed to just allowing unlimited time, started uh, in 1997, modestly, and in 2004 became the rule. By now, every government, virtually every government bill is programmed. It sets a date by which it has to come out of committee. It limits the uh, time to be devoted by, to the bill when it comes back to the floor of the House for consideration of third reading. And if made at the same sitting as that in which the bill was read, it is put without debate and without the possibility of moving any amendment. Uh, that is a bit ruthless, uh, and I think there is a good case for allowing for some sort of amendments to be moved, at least to programme motions, because those are the ones that constrain the amount of the time that can be spent on talking about it. 
Now, it was never foreseen by my predecessors who drafted the rules that a government bill would once be given a second reading, in this case by a very large majority, we had a, in July, but the government would then not move the motion for the programme order, which would leave the bill floating in mid-air. But this is actually what happened, and always the unthinkable happens, with the House of Lords reform bill. To remind you, in July, ministers suspected they would be defeated on the programme motion if they moved it because the Labour opposition, although willing to vote, indeed enthusiastic, to vote for second reading, was going to vote against the programme motion because it didn't want any constraints on the length of time the bill would have to take going through the House. And they would be joined by a large number of Conservative backbench rebels who were maybe not, uh, some of whom would have voted against second reading the bill and others of whom uh, showed their doubts about the bill by saying that they didn't want to have any limitation on a debate. And with no limitation on a debate of a bill of that nature, it would go on forever and ever and ever. Uh, so the ministers, therefore, just decided not to move the motion, which left us in a difficulty because nobody knew where the bill was. So we, or I think it's probably my fault, I, we, we explained that it was in limbo. I don't know if you know what limbo is, but it's a theological term, and apparently it no longer exists in the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. What we should have said is awaiting committal, because it's been read a second time and it hasn't been committed. But I thought the phrase awaiting committal had a slightly unpleasant overtone. But most government bills, those that get through this stage, then go either to a public bill committee or to a committee of the whole house, or exceptionally to a select committee. The main bills that go to a select committee are what are called hybrid bills which are basically private bills, like the Humber Bridge Bill, but that have been presented under public bill procedure, partly because they are government-sponsored. They're not sponsored by the Humber Bridge Commissioners or the Humber Bridge Board, but they are sponsored by government. And this year, we're going to have one. We didn't have one last year. There'll be one There's probably, you know, there's a railway being driven called HS2, or maybe driven north from London um, uh, through the home counties and, and possibly gradually reaching Yorkshire. So that will be dealt with through a select committee procedure, uh, and the regular armed forces bill, which hours ago I mentioned, you may remember, also goes to a select committee. They then examine it, meaning they try to sit in a bipartisan way, take evidence, but they can also then change the bill and report it back to the House. And consideration is being given to doing that more often, to committing more bills to select committees, where the spirit of select committee investigation and inquiry, rather than of partisan debate and scrutiny, can, can be imported. Uh, it is generally observed that bills of what are called first-class constitutional importance, I've never seen a bill of which regular described as of second or, or visitor class, or what's the tourist class constitutional importance, they go to committee of the whole house, which means the whole of the 650 members become a committee, um, which means they can talk as, as, as much as they like to a single question and that the speaker's not in the chair. And all members can table amendments and take part in debate and decision. And so are urgent bills because it's by its nature a swifter procedure than setting up a committee upstairs to send it to, short and relatively uncontroversial bills, and sometimes short but controversial bills. This session we had the welfare benefits uprating bill, which put the 1% cap on welfare benefits. The advantage of the government is there's no report stage. It's, it's a, it's a one-bang, they get it through committee of the whole house unamended, they move straight to third reading. But there are drawbacks in bills in committee of the whole house. Members, as you may imagine, can find it rather a daunting experience, uh, probing amendments, exposing their possible personal uncertainties about what a bill is doing in detail in, in the grand surrounds of a very, very empty chamber. There's none of that shared sense of purpose you can get with a smaller number of members in a small room that are regularly meeting together. Voting is much more time-consuming. It takes 15 minutes to vote in the House of Commons chamber compared to about a minute in a committee upstairs, or less than that, of 20 people. And, of course, if it's taken downstairs in the whole house looking at it, no evidence can be taken. You can't have witnesses examined by 650 people. Now, we had the Electoral Registration and Ad Electoral Administration and Registration Bill uh, in the summer of last year went through Committee of the Whole House, and I think all the members involved felt they might have had a more constructive and helpful debate if it had been in a committee upstairs. So more thought is being given to dividing bills between maybe vital bits could be downstairs, but most other bits could go upstairs, and you might conceivably allow all members to attend the upstairs bit, the committee upstairs, although not to move amendments or to vote, but at least if they want to attend and take part in these debates, they could. 
Now, public bill committees, um, to which most bills are committed, comprise uh, typically around 20 members reflecting the party composition of the chamber. Uh, in 2009, the Right Committee on Reform of the House of Commons concluded that it was about time that the means of selecting these members was looked at. And the Hansard Society, I don't know how many of you know the Hansard Society, is about to bring out a report very soon which will be making uh, radical proposals, so I'll leave it there. Uh, as to what public bill committees do, uh, Louise Thompson of this university, I think, published... Is she here? Have, I hope Louise published a paper in Parliamentary Affairs on the impact of public bill committees over the first decade of this century. Uh, well, over the last 10 years, we could say. What it showed is, I think, slightly unexpectedly to some of us, that actually committees were spending longer scrutinising these bills and they were discussing more amendments than they did in what some of the old and bold say 30 or 40 years ago was a much richer environment, but that significantly fewer amendments to the bill were actually made in the committee. Um, I think, Louise, you, you, you entitled your thesis, Visco is it about viscosity? I didn't understand that. But I, <laughs> um, and an article on, the, on their operation a few years ago asked the reasonable question, rubber stamp or cockpit? I think that was... Again, are these committees merely rubber stamps, just agreeing the bills, or is it a tremendous place of fighting? Well, a bit of both, probably. One example which you can, if you have the time, and I do read, is on the marriage same-sex couples bill, which I did read partly because the substance is such an interesting subject anyway. They didn't make a single amendment. The bill went through completely unamended, and I read an article about this that said, what a waste of time. I don't think it was. There were fantastic debates um, there was, a, in fact, one division on a, it was a tie at seven each. Uh, but the important thing is all the issues that people wanted to raise were raised, discussed, um, and, and there is now a much clearer idea amongst those people who will then, in about 10 days' time, when the report stage comes up in the House of Commons, will at least have crystallised what is a real worry and what isn't, depending, obviously, from which of the many sides of the argument you come. So what can you expect from these committees? Well, we shouldn't expect forensic, non-partisan scrutiny and learned debate. They're not postgraduate seminars in some institute of legislative studies in the cloistered calm of a campus. They are a political debating forum on a series of detailed policy propositions which have been put forward by ministers. So the debates that take place in these public bill committees are by way of amendment. And they are, by the way, of, ex of exploring the provisions of the bill to see if it stands up to hostile, but hopefully not wholly destructive, analysis. Much as in a court of law, cross-examination is designed not to expose lies, but to discover some sort of truth. So the output is not to be measured by changes. The, the amendments discussed are often simply a peg or a, a, a way of framing a question or crux on which to argue rather than representing a formed desire to change the bill in the way that the amendment suggests. So ministers are forced to defend or feel forced to defend the proposals that are in the bill. The advantage of that is they have to be satisfied with the advice that they are getting from their officials. So the terms of a bill are tried and tested in that crucible of debate. Secondly, the opposition can use it as a means of exploring their own views in some detail, which are unlikely to have been fully formed at the time of second reading. And thirdly, and perhaps potentially most importantly, the world outside Westminster, civil society, should have, if it's interested in detail in the provisions of a bill, a clear idea of what the bill is intended to achieve and how it will operate. It has, or it should have, an educative or expository function. The procedures in these committees are, I fear, not necessarily designed to achieve these ends. They are perhaps excessively attuned to a dialectical process of textual amendment. And it does seem odd to me that members who wish to ask simple questions and get simple answers while a bill is going through, it's not easy for them to do that. It is assumed you should put down amendments. So there may be a space for a more directly and explicitly interrogatory procedure through a process of, let us say, oral and written question and answer, rather than relying always on amendment. In the recent years, public bill committees have started with several sessions of oral evidence, that's to say question and answer, from a range of witnesses, which is intended to help committee members identify the detailed issues and to give civil society, the people who are de deeply engaged in the bill, a chance to make their representations and to answer questions. Again, I would urge you to read the same-sex 
uh, marriage, the same-sex couples bill, for a good example of really interesting and vigorous oral evidence, as you can imagine, from a range of, uh, a range of people, uh, including a, a particularly argumentative bishop. Uh, in fact, in the earlier days, before we had evidence, of course, civil society still made contact with members so that they are sitting in the room in the Public Bill Committee would be the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, let us say, who would have memoranda they would hand out to members perfectly properly, and they would talk to them in the corridor outside, or the Institute of Housing, or the Association of Directors of Social Services, or whatever the bill was about. So that was always going on to say, this is, where we, this is an amendment we'd like you to think about next week, or why don't you argue this? The advantage now, it's transparent. We all know what interest groups are saying to members, and everybody can know because they're published on the website. One disadvantage is that bills that start in the Lords, and about a third of major government bills start in the Lords rather than starting in the Commons, because if they all started in the same House, uh, the Commons would have nothing to do for the second half of the year, and the Lords would have little to do for the first half of the year. Uh, that if they start in the Lords, um, committees don't generally take evidence on them. So uh, they can take, the public bill committees can take written evidence uh, on Lord's bills, but not oral evidence. And I suspect that that convention will soon be revisited uh, because the Lord's committee, the Lords don't have committees on bills and are therefore not able to take evidence. Uh, I want to have a word about the public reading stage. Uh, the Coalition Agreement of 2010 committed to introducing something called a public reading stage. The idea is that members of the public would be able to comment on a bill in detail. We've had three of these so far. Uh, the most recent one on the Children and Families Bill, and it remains uncertain uh, whether and when there will be more. But I suspect in the coming session there will be another one. Uh, and it is, in a sense, merely an extension of what we're doing anyway by actually going out to the public and having an electronic forum and with the bill on it, and you can look at it and you can say, at Clause 32, you can post a comment and somebody will read it. I'm not going to say they're going to change the bill as a result, but somebody will read it. Okay, so that's the end of the committee stage. Report, or technically consideration, is when the House as a whole has a chance to look at and amend a bill. Now, most members find this the most frustrating side of legislative procedure, and the Right Reform Committee in 2009 agreed. Ministers can use it to bring forward new material, either in response to the debate in committee or elsewhere, or because they didn't have full agreement to it before, or because they hadn't thought of it before. The official opposition gets a chance to get votes of the whole House on the three or four issues in the bill it feels most strongly about, and often forgotten backbenchers, because there are a lot of other members who don't represent, the, the, who are not clearly represented by the views of the two front benches, get a chance to put their views. Now, there never seems to be time. Um, the chair does its best through the, the grouping lots of amendments together in, in, in big amorphous debates. Or maybe it's simply that time is ineffectively used or distributed for all matters to be voted upon. Now, there are a range of remedies being looked at for this, and this is, in a sense, the most crucial weakness in legislative procedure. The most recent example, we had the Crime and Courts Bill, which was effectively report stage was hijacked at the last moment by the debate which all sides wanted, on the new clauses relating to the implementation of Leveson, uh, press, I think I'm allowed to call it press regulation. As a result of that, other things that were rather more closely connected to crime and courts, and you may say, what's Leveson got to do with crime and courts? And the, the clue is in the word courts. Um, other things, including, for example, a, a debate where there was a lot of controversy about extradition, was simply not held because there was no time for it because it just fell off the bottom. And finally, you'll be glad to hear, except it's not quite finally, we come to third reading, which is the last stage of a bill, the stamping. These are generally rather lacklustre debates of half an hour or so, where there's a mood of relief and self-congratulation. Uh, and um, they are debatable. It does, however, give a chance, and particularly the vote gives a chance, for a last look at a bill. Uh, and you might say, well, if you voted for it on second reading, why wouldn't you vote for it on third reading? Well, some members say, and some mean it, I'm going to look at the bill. I'm willing to go ahead with it on second reading. I won't rebel here. But I'll have to see at third reading if it still, if it meets my concerns that I expressed. And returning to marriage, same-sex couples bill, and possibly the Euro European Union bill sometimes, and if the House of Lords bill had gone way through, there would have been people who'd said, I'm not going to allow this bill through unless X happens to it on the way through. And we had an example last session, the Justice and Security bill, which came from the Lords, which was divided on, on on third reading. The government won very easily. 13 MPs voted against. 
uh, six Labour, four Liberal Democrat, three, uh, three SNP, one Conservative, one Green. So that's from every party. Tiny group of members, but they ones who they gave them a chance to put on the record their concerns about what are called closed material procedures, the introduction of so-called secret, secret evidence in, in civil cases. So now it's gone from the common sigh of relief and it goes up to the Lords. Is that the end? No, it isn't. If a Commons bill is returned, it comes back with or with amendments, the Commons then consider those Lords' amendments. And that can go on until the text is agreed. In theory, the whole of the text is agreed by both houses. Now, the back and forth, for some reason, you know what it's called. People call it ping-pong, uh, or whiff-waff, as I think Boris calls it. Um, I, I, we even now call it ping-pong on our website, I'm embarrassed to admit, um, because there's no other short phrase for it. It, the, um, the basic idea behind this and the internet, is that where you've agreed on something, you mustn't open up new areas of disagreement. So the only thing you're discussing when, quote, the bill comes back from the Lords is not the bill, but the amendments. Those of you familiar, as I'm sure you all are, with aspects of family life know that when you're having an argument, it's very important to concentrate on what you are having an argument about and so that it doesn't spill over into who takes out the dustbins or does the washing up or other things. Just concentrate on the point of disagreement, not the many, many other points in the context around. So the Commons can agree with the Lord's Amendment and it generally, the Commons agrees with a vast mass of Lord's Amendments. Why? Is it because of the wisdom, of the senatorial wisdom of the House of Lords? Perhaps it may have something to do with most of them were actually moved by ministers in the House of Lords in the first place, and therefore the government, which commands a majority in the Commons, is likely to agree to them, usually without opposition. It can amend a Lord's Amendment and then seek agreement to that amendment, uh, usually, usually but not always in a fairly friendly way. It can disagree to a Lord's Amendment, and where it disagrees, it assigns a reason, the text of which is, is agreed by a little mini-committee in a little mini-room. If it disagreed to a Lord's Amendment, it can propose an amendment in lieu, that's to say an alternative but related proposition. Or if the original amendment, and this is where I'm losing you, if the original amendment sought to leave out some words, you can amend the words restored to the bill. For example, if the amendment from the Lord says, leave out Clause 6, we don't like it, the Commons can say, no, no, we disagree to that amendment. We're going to, we want to maintain Clause 6. But to go a little bit of the way to meet your concerns, we will amend Clause 6. And we'll send back some amendments to the words restored. And, which is a nightmare, it can propose consequential amendments to the bill. In other words, because of stuff the Commons is doing, it has consequences. So you see why it's fun. It's a sort of wonderful intellectual game, except it's not game, it is, and it is easily understood if you concentrate on the fact it's about politics and policies. And that makes, to me, the last week of every session the most enjoyable and sleepless and exciting. There is one issue about Lord's Amendments, uh, which, before I come to an end, which is to do with money. Uh, because the, basically the Lords, being an unelected house, are not supposed to take the initiative on spending money or raising taxes. So when amendments come back from the Lords that seem to do either of those two things, they are identified as infringing the Commons' privileges and they get a little P put next to them. Most of them agreed anyway because they were moved by ministers in the Lords and it's simply to say we have noticed this involves money but we're very happy to agree to it. So for example, in the last session we had a public service pensions bill. There were 16 uh, of the amendments that came back were designated as engaging privilege, and 14 of them were just simply agreed to by the Commons. Not a problem. But two were not, which sought to basically improve the pension terms of the Defence Fire and Rescue Service and the Ministry of Defence Police. Now, the, the reason the Commons disagreed with it isn't really because of the money. It's the matter of the policy involved. The government felt strongly that we shouldn't be extending the same early retirement provisions to the Ministry of Defence Police as may be enjoyed by the, by the uh, other police forces. So, but then we have to send back a reason if we disagree for money reasons, saying we disagree with this because of money. And there's a form of words that's used, which then annoys their lordships, who feel that we're trying to hide behind money when actually we're just straight disagreeing with them. So why bother to have reasons? Well, the, and this is my last, but the fact is nobody knows. <laughs> reasons are a survival, I believe, from, from distant days when neither house knew what the other was saying. There was no transcript. So the Lords would suddenly get some, some message from the Commons saying, we've disagreed to your amendment number 17. And the Lords would say, well, why? And nobody would know. Whereas now, of course, every 
uh, Hansard that is on the web within three hours of it being said, and certainly within the next day it's in a bound volume. So it's very easy to find out what the real reason is for disagreeing to an amendment. It also dates back to the days when the two houses would meet together and appoint effectively managers, the way the Congress still does, to try to work out uh, a compromise. And so you sent the managers off with a reason, so they remembered why it was that the House had disagreed with the thing in the first place. Well, you'll be delighted to hear, I've exhausted myself, I've probably exhausted you, <laughs> uh, and we haven't even got to the Lords, let alone to Royal Assent and the use of Norman French. I just hope that what you've heard has inspired you a little, if you didn't have it, in an interest in the passage of legislation, a recognition, which I'm sure you did have, of its importance and its significance, and of its close connection with politics, which is why I've tried to give examples from bills on matters that are of substantial political interest, uh, and a willingness to engage with the legislative process. Thank you very much. <laughs>